to Immunology, The War Is Over, episode four, Cytotoxic T-cell soldiers. Okay, so far in this series, we've covered T-cell development in the thymus, and we've explored in great detail the CD4 T-helper cells. What gets them going, what subsets they divide into, and the drugs we can use to block this. And placing emphasis on CD4 T-cells was necessary and deliberate because they orchestrate adaptive immunity overall. But now I'd like to shift your attention towards CD8 T-cells or cytotoxic T-cells. Now, helpfully, CD8 T-cells are similar to CD4 T-cells in a number of ways. They both grow up in the thymus and have a unique T-cell receptor directed against a specific antigen. After leaving the thymus, they both hang out in secondary lymphoid tissue, such as their lymph nodes and spleen. But they also have some key differences. CD8 T-cells recognise antigens that are presented via MHC1 molecules. They do not interact with MHC2. And because most cells in our body are capable of stacking antigens onto MHC1 molecules, this means that CD8 T-cells can communicate directly with infected cells and act on that information right then and there. So if a cell is infected with a virus, the cell can take parts of that virus, stack it onto MHC1 molecules and place these on the surface of the cell to attract attention. If a cytotoxic T-cell just happens to swing by with a matching T-cell receptor, then that cytotoxic T-cell can be directly activated to destroy that cell. However, that said, T-helper cells can also activate cytotoxic T-cells. And whether CD8 T-cells are activated directly by infected cells or by CD4 T-cells really comes down to the pathogen that you're dealing with. So, for example, influenza-infected cells can spark off CD8 T-cells directly, whereas HSV infections benefit from T-helper cells encouraging CD8 T-cells to respond. The other key difference between CD8 T-cells and CD4 T-cells is that CD8 T-cells, when they proliferate, will not differentiate into subsets with varied functions like the T-helpers do. CD8 T-cells are far more straightforward and consistent in their mission to develop into cytotoxic T-cells. That's not to say that there aren't subtle differences in terms of their inner workings though. Some will become effector cells and others will become memory cells. But by and large, they have the same mission. So CD8 T-cells are far more simple creatures than their CD4 counterparts. Now, we said before that the CD4 T-cells help to activate CD8 T-cells. And that's not exactly intuitive, but it is fascinating. And so over the next few minutes, we're going to unpack this concept in a bit more detail. Once a CD4 T-cell has become activated by an antigen-presenting cell within the lymph node, it's going to be triggered to differentiate into a particular T-helper subset depending on the type of pathogen presented. So a viral infection will typically kick off a Th1 response, which generates a cytokine profile which is perfect for combating intracellular organisms. But what's really interesting is that the CD4 T-cell Before it ends the cuddle party with the dendritic cell, it will send a signal to that dendritic cell that it must now go and present that same antigen to a cytotoxic T cell within the lymph node. So, as you can imagine, the dendritic cell will be suitably unimpressed. After all, that work it already put in in finding and activating its CD4 T cell, it now has to go and find a cytotoxic T cell which also recognises the same antigen. It's another needle in another haystack. And as if that wasn't enough, it's got to go and change its entire communication device on the surface. So instead of using MHC2 molecules, it now has to switch to MHC1 molecules in order to communicate communicate with this CD8 T cell. So the dendritic cell really does deserve a lot of acknowledgement in this process. It really is working very hard. And when the dendritic cell finds its respective CD8 T cell, the process of antigen presentation and T cell activation is very familiar. It involves signal one, when the T cell receptor binds to the MHC antigen complex. This creates a stop signal where both cells increase their adhesion molecules and connect to each other more strongly. 
And then signal two, co-stimulation happens with all of the characters from episode three, who you'll be very familiar with by now. And if you haven't watched episode three, I highly recommend you go back and do that. It's a hoot. So when a CD4 T cell promotes a CD8 response, the first thing it does is send the dendritic cell to the CD8 T cell to get it fired up. But then after the initial activation, the CD4 T cell then provides further fuel to this fire. Remember how we said in episode two that interleukin-2 is like T cell fuel? It's like the T cell putting on the kettle and making itself a coffee. Well, CD8 T cells can make a little bit of interleukin-2 coffee, but not quite as well as CD4 T cells can. It's sort of like CD8 has instant coffee granules, but CD4 has an espresso machine and a barista. So CD4 just makes better coffee and more of it. And so the vast majority of interleukin-2 is generated by the CD4 T cells, but this can be used by CD8 T cells as well. And in harmony with this, the cytotoxic T cell response is very much encouraged by interleukin-12 and interferon, which you'll remember are the same cytokines which promote the T helper 1 subset. So in fighting an intracellular organism, you can expect Th1 T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells to be involved, and these will be working collaboratively. The T helper cells are producing the cytokines which are going to encourage the CD8 T cells to do their thing. And the CD8 T cells, with this encouragement, are going to proliferate into an army of cytotoxic T cells which will go forth, find those infected cells, and destroy them. And when I say an army, I mean literally an army of hundreds of thousands of T-cells who are going to go in search of these infected cells. Now, remember that T-cells aren't killing the organism directly. They are killing the cells in which these organisms reside, which probably explains why having a viral infection feels so incredibly awful. Your cells are literally dying inside you. And killing these infected cells is a highly effective approach. The intracellular organism will no longer be able to use that cell's machinery to replicate. And that cell that just died, and all of the organisms within it, will be chomped up by phagocytes. And if these organisms just happen to spill out of the cell and into the bloodstream, then that's great because in our circulation, we have antibodies and complement and immune cells that can now reach that organism and destroy it. Okay, so cytotoxic T cells kill infected cells, but how exactly do they do this? And in order to kill those infected cells, the T cell must jump out of the bloodstream and infiltrate the infected tissue. But the human body is a big place, right? How do the T cells know where to go? We're going to answer both of those questions now. So firstly, how does a T cell know where the infected cells are? And this is awesome. Mother Nature has installed a really cool mechanism, a homing device known as CXCR3. CXCR3 is expressed on all activated T cells, both CD4 and CD8 T cells have this device installed. When a tissue becomes infected, it can express the receptor for CXCR3, also known as CXCR3 ligand, and this receptor is then placed there with the help of interferon. We said before that interferon is a cytokine which is necessary for the immune response to intracellular infections. And we saw how interferon encourages the Th1 and cytotoxic T cell responses within the lymph node. But a further role of interferon is placing these CXCR3 receptors in the capillary beds of infected tissue in order to attract T cells into that area. So interferon tells T cells where to go. And interferon can be produced by most cells in our body in response to infection. But a few tissues are particularly good at this, such as the lung and the gut. And the CXCR3 homing device is used by both CD4 
and CD8 T cells, and not uncommonly this will occur in sequence. So, for example, Th1 T helper cells might travel to the tissue using CXCR3, and then when they are in that tissue, they themselves secrete lots of interferon, which further increases CXCR3 receptors in the area and attracts CD8 T cells. Again, another example of the harmony between T helpers and cytotoxic T cells. Okay, so that's how the CD8 and CD4 T cells, for that matter, know where to go. Once the cytotoxic T cells arrive at the infected destination, their mission is to kill all infected cells without hesitation. And there are a couple of ways in which they do this. Say, for example, the intracellular pathogen is a virus. For the most part, cells containing a virus will display viral antigens on their surface using MHC1 molecules. Cytotoxic T cells bind to this complex using their T cell receptor. And now a number of things will happen. Firstly, deployment of toxic granules and perforin. Perforins are able to create pores within the cell. Once perforin has created these pores, the proteases granzyme A and granzyme B are infused into the cell using these pores. And if you think about it, this is very clever. These toxic substances are injected only into infected cells in a discreet and deliberate manner. So the T cell isn't spilling all of its toxic contents onto just any cell in the area. Its toxicity is targeted to individual cells with ninja precision. And when these digestive enzymes are injected into a cell, the cell will die. And whilst you might imagine some kind of dramatic cellular explosion at this stage, the process is actually very graceful. The infected cell, which has basically begged this T cell to come along and destroy it, is complicit in the process. And once the digestive enzymes are inside, this will trigger apoptosis. And so this is very altruistic. Although the cytotoxic T cells deserve some credit for sure, this process only works because the cells in our body are able to collaborate with those T cells, and I think that deserves a special mention as well. And another way in which our cells undergo altruistic apoptosis is by using something known as death receptors. Get this, cells in our body can literally place death receptors on their surface and these death receptors can be activated by both CD8 and CD4 T cells. One of these death receptors is known as FAS and both CD8 and CD4 T cells can express FAS ligand. So if a T cell comes along expressing FAS ligand and binds to FAS on a body cell, this will activate intracellular signaling pathways which leads to apoptosis of that cell. And whilst this all sounds very sad, it's actually really beautiful and brave of our cells to do this, to end their own existence in the name of our bigger picture health. So as much as our T cells are wonderful, we have to remember every cell in our body is similarly wonderful. And so I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this helped your studies and you have oodles of appreciation for our cytotoxic T cells and every cell in your body. Next up, we'll be continuing our immunological journey by getting up close and personal with B cells, plasma cells, and antibodies. I'll see you in there. <laughs>